Good afternoon and welcome everyone. My name is Alison Hoons. I'm an affiliate knowledge broker at Arthritis Research Canada and a member of the Arthritis Research Canada's Arthritis Patient Advisory Board. I'm thrilled to be your moderator for this afternoon's webinar and excited to learn from our guest research scientists. This webinar is presented in support of episode number four of the Arthritis Research Education Series. This topic was chosen because of the increasing interest in and importance of cardiovascular disease and arthritis. If you're joining us for the first time today, the Arthritis Research Education Series was created by Arthritis Research Canada's Arthritis Patient Advisory Board. The purpose of this series is to provide an in-depth look at specific areas of research and to share in an informal manner an in-depth look at specific areas of research for, that are relevant and meaningful to the patients and to the public. In addition, this is a great opportunity for everyone to get together while physically distancing. Many of you may have already viewed the videos for this episode on our website. And this afternoon, we're delighted to have our featured researcher here in person, virtually in person, to give a short presentation on his work. After the presentation, there will be some time set aside for your questions. Please feel free to submit your questions into at any time during the webinar by clicking on the Q&A icon, which is on the lower right-hand side of your screen. It is my pleasure to introduce the illustrious speaker for today, Dr. Antonio Avina Zubiata. Um, Dr. Zubiata is a senior scientist, and by this mean we don't mean elderly, uh, even though it is his birthday today. So he's doing as an extra special favor on his birthday by sharing uh, a special day with us. Um, he's uh, at Arthritis Research Canada and an associate professor in the Division of Rheumatology in the Department of Medicine at the University of British Columbia. He's also a rheumatologist. He's the BC Lupus Society Research Scholar and a Walter and Marilyn Booth Research Scholar. Dr. Avina Zubiata's research focuses on the economic burden and cardiovascular complications associated with systemic autoimmune rheumatic diseases, otherwise known as SARDs. And those include diseases such as systemic lupus erythematosus, systemic sclerosis, Sjogren's disease, and others. So without further ado, I'd like to turn over to Dr. Avina Zubiata. Hi, everyone. Thank you, uh, Alison, for the kind introduction and the undeserved uh, words. And uh, yes, it is my birthday, and this is the best way to celebrate. I was saying that with uh, patient partners and with patients, education, Series is a great uh, adventure that the Patient Advisory Board of Arthritis Research Canada has created, and, and I'm thrilled to be here. So um, I hope everybody at home is safe and with the loved ones, and thank you for joining us, and I hope you take a good message uh, out of this presentation. And if not, um, email me and I do it back again uh, better. Uh, so with no more nothing to say, I will actually, um, would like to start with the first uh, slide, please. Thank you. Uh, I have no declared interest to conflict of interest for this presentation. This is a rule that we are scientists affiliated with universities have to say. Uh, this uh, research has been done for the last 10 years of my life here at UBC, and it has been funded through uh, peer review grants uh, by taxpayers. That's the only conflict of interest, if any. So if you pay for it and you are getting the benefits of it, hopefully. Next slide, please. I think this is for Alison. Yeah, so just before we started with uh, Dr. Avina um, sharing with us some facts, we wanted to know a little bit about you. So we have a few polling questions. So I'm gonna ask the wizards behind the curtains here to post our first polling question for everybody.
So if you could just choose the option which best describes you. Are you someone living with arthritis? Are you a family member of someone living with arthritis? Are you a caregiver, a healthcare professional, or other? And if you fit in the other category, feel free to type in the chat box uh, what that other is. And we'll give everyone just a few minutes. I see that we have just short of 100 people joining us right now. That's exciting. Um, so I'm looking forward to see what the distribution might be here. And then when the wizards behind the curtain have seen that there's um, uh, enough responses, then we'll share the results. And can we have the polling results, please? And survey says, Almost 90% are people living with arthritis. And we have a few people that are healthcare professionals and caregivers or family members. And a few people that are other and in the chat box, a freelance health writer. So thank you all for joining us. Um, can we have the next polling question, please? Uh, have you, if you've been diagnosed with arthritis, have you ever had blood clots, a stroke, and or a heart attack. Today we're talking about cardiovascular disease and those include, that includes blood clots, stroke and a heart attack. So we just want to sense from you if that's something that you've had to deal with. So a simple yes or no. And we'll give everybody just a second to respond and then we'll look at the results. And now can we have the results please? And survey says, great news, 92% of the 90 people who are, uh, of the 90% of the 100 people who are joining us today have not had a diagnosis of blood clot, stroke, or heart attack. So that's a very good setting for um, the rest of the presentation. So we'll finish with the polling questions and turn back over to Dr. Avina Zubiata's presentation. Thank you. Uh, that was great actually to see that uh, pool because it tells me what the audience is and what is the, um, the expectation for me to transfer to them. So it's good to see actually that 80% or 92% of people do not have heart attacks or blood clots. This is great. And we'll see at the end why this is relevant. So, uh, as I said before, I've been doing my research using what is called administrative health data. And this is very important when you actually want to interpret the results that you get from it. Um, and also I'm going to tell you how I've been using them to generate the knowledge that we've been doing the last 10 years. And this is very important because <clears throat> when you read studies for almost any topic in the literature, you will find that there is some people saying this is true and some people are saying this is not true. And the difference relies not just in the science, but also belongs in the populations that you study. It's not always the same and quite often you have to think about who are those people in those studies. And this is one of the things that we've been doing very careful here in BC and other scientists across Canada. And I explained to you in the next slide please. So in Canada, and BC is not the exception, we have one single healthcare system that provides uh, all the services that we, we need, most of them. Um, and that, that allows us to actually track the healthcare trajectory of all individuals. Since we have one single payer, the government creates a system where every time you have a healthcare encounter, you have to submit a diagnosis and the test that you order or whatever you do. And that allows you or us to single mark people who have one encounter with two diagnoses, three diagnoses, and what was the diagnosis. And that data is collected 
at different levels in electronic and medical records, by local health authorities through their hospitals, their investigations, and the Ministry of Health at the end of the day collects all the information and send it or allows Population Data BC. Population Data BC is an institution, a research institute hosted at UBC, which is the University, the University of British Columbia. And they are the responsible, the guardians, <coughs> excuse me, of uh, keeping the data safe, the identified and anonymous. And they allow all researchers in BC, and I think it seems to be like in Canada very soon, as a single entry point to access that data for research purposes. As I said before, it includes all individuals in the province currently living. And this has been collected since 1990. So it's a very rich data that can be used to answer questions that represents the general population. Next slide, please. So what is the type of data that we actually have there? We have all the doctor visits, which include a diagnosis for the main reason of visiting, all hospitalizations in the province, regardless of which hospital you go, all the investigations that were done. And in BC, which is unique to many other provinces, I think there are only two other provinces who collect also all the medications that are dispensed by a pharmacist, regardless who pays for them, as long as they're dispensed by the pharmacy. We also have the demographics, including the people who live there, people who have the sex, the age, all the cancer data, the, the vital statistics, etc. So, and we have even enriched that data with new lab uh, results, which were not available before. And this is a very large effort done in Arthritis Research Canada, which is very unique. And now we also have survey data that allows to ask people for information that is not available in the administrative data. Next slide. So this is a very powerful, very rich data that includes every single body in the province. Most of the data that I've done, I, or the research that I have done includes all people living in BC, which is around 4.7. Currently we have 5.1 million and we just have new data there. So we have studied all individuals who have more, are older than 18 years of age, who had been in the province since 1990 or who had been, I mean, the data since 1990 and onwards. We have identified all individuals with all type of arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, et cetera. We also have people who do not have rheumatoid arthritis and there are the comparison groups. When you wanna do comparison about risk, you really need a good comparison group that represents the general population. If you don't have a good control group, then your estimates are not accurate. Next slide. And we have done this in all our research. This is very important. Now, since we're going to talk about what is cardiovascular disease, it depends what people think of cardiovascular disease. Chest pain that is not associated with ischemic events or suffering of the heart muscle are not considered heart disease. Um, so, and also what is important in arthritis. Next slide. And we'll start with the most recent topic that is actually hot in the market these days, blood clots. So, uh, typically, cardiovascular disease includes two main aspects of the circulatory system. The arterial side, which is the side that comes out of the, the blood vessels that go out of the heart to deliver clean blood with oxygen to the tissues. And the venous side, which is the blood that goes back to the heart and the lungs to get new oxygen and create a loop. So most of the heart disease in the past has been always thought to be only the arterial side, which is the heart and the brain arteries, which was the stroke and the heart attacks. Recently, we have shown that the arteri the venous side is also main affected in these in this, uh, rheumatic diseases. And I'll show you some data on it. Next slide, please. So how serious is the problem of blood clots? You may have heard the term also venous thromboembolism, but here we're gonna talk about blood clots. It depends on where the blood clot is, is what the, the disease that it provokes. So in the US, that has 300 million people or about 300 million people, it affects 1 million each year, new cases. 70% are in the legs, 24%, one in five, 
are in um, one in four actually in the lungs that are the bad one because they could lead to death and 6% happening both sides. And this is the third most common cardiovascular event after heart attacks and strokes. And it could lead to a lot of disability and, and substantial death over time, even after recovery. Um, how you, just to see the numbers, and this is important because I'm sure it's gonna come back in the questions. How often this happen in the, in, in the general population? You will see around 70 to 100 cases for every 100,000 individuals in a year. So it's a rare phenomenon, but still happens no matter what. And it's the same for male and females and races had an influence on it. For instance, uh, Asians from Pacific Islander and Hispanics tend to have lower risk than other populations. So, um, it's a younger population was also very rare to have those events, 30 cases if you're 25 to 35, but also it goes significantly higher up after when you age, 30 to 500 K, 300 to 500 cases in the late age. And as you can imagine, it goes gradually from 35 to the next decade and gradually keeps increasing. So it's a rare phenomenon, especially if it happens in young individuals. And that's when you have to use comparison groups that has to be the same age or the same sex to actually make a fair comparison because the risk exists in the population and is always there, but you have to make, uh, assess against the rheumatic disease. And we have done research on all rheumatic diseases in BC over the last 10 years. And this is the risk that we found on blood clots in the different diseases. Dermatomyositis, which is an inflammatory disease of the muscles that also can give arthritis. The risk is eight folds compared to the general population who do not have the same disease and the same age and the same gender and adjusting for other factors that influence the risk. So this is the only sole risk attributable to the disease. For polymy polymyositis, which is a different disease, uh, only affects the muscle, the other one affects the skin, and the muscle, lupus 3.6, systemic sclerosis, also known as scleroderma, almost three, uh, fourfold, Sjogren disease three times, giant cell arthritis, which is one of the vasculitis seen in the elderly, 2.5, ankylosing spondylitis 1.5, rheumatoid arthritis 1.3, and GAD 1.4. So why this wide range of, of risk? First of all, we see, think is the, the age. The age varies between the diseases, but also because of the inflammatory levels. Uh, diseases who have a very systemic high level of inflammation have higher risk, like the myositis and polymyositis and lupus. And others who have just systemic or inflammatory disease only on the joints, but not other organs, such as gout or rheumatoid arthritis, tend to have a lower risk, but the risk is still present. The most important thing here is the risk we have seen in all diseases, the highest risk is always in the first year after the diagnosis. And we leave this belief because this is when the inflammatory disease is at its peak before treatment. And then when you get the treatment, the risk decrease over time, but still remains elevated even after five years of on, on, on medication. Next slide, please. So uh, how about other diseases that is not blood clots? Cardiovascular disease in general, which includes heart attacks and strokes combined. Well, the same phenomenon you see is not as high as blood clot, but the, the same diseases who were very high systemic inflammatory marker or levels of inflammation have higher risk than the other ones who have less systemic involvement. Uh, and um, the same phenomenon happened. The highest risk goes in the first year and gradually decreases over time, but remains elevated. Uh, if you have any of those diseases, you can pair yourselves on which group, uh, how high is your risk. And remember, this is the risk compared to an individual, the same age, the same sex, and uh, with no rheumatic disease. Next slide. 
So let's review quickly on a specific disease, which is rheumatoid arthritis, which is one of the most prevalent rheumatic diseases of, uh, of the inflammatory arthritis in the, general, in, in the general population. So people with rheumatic diseases with rheumatoid arthritis have a higher risk of cardiovascular disease than the general population. 50% higher risk compared. Remember, heart disease is the main killer in the general population, depending on the age, of course, but in general, cardiovascular disease is the main. In addition to that, people with rheumatic diseases or rheumatoid arthritis have 50% increased risk above the general population risk. 80%, 80, almost 90% of hair failure, which is a rare disease, well, it's not a rare disease, but it has been rarely studied, um, 68% for heart attacks and 48% for stroke. So heart attacks are more prevalent in, in, as a cardiovascular disease than strokes, which are blood clots in the arteries of the brain. People with rheumatoid arthritis also have more silent or no symptomatic heart disease. They also have higher rates of death. Not everybody who has a heart attack dies, but people with rheumatoid arthritis may have or actually have a higher risk of dying from heart attack than the general population. And they also have more repeated events or more heart attacks after the first one. So this is a very important topic in people with rheumatoid arthritis, and I'm sure it can be extrapolated to other rheumatic diseases. <coughs> Excuse me. Also, patients with high, rheumatoid arthritis have high risk of death, as I mentioned before. So, and it's, the risk is the same for males and females, uh, which is different from what happens in the general population. In general population, males have a higher risk of developing cardiovascular disease. But in rheumatoid arthritis, even though the disease is more prevalent or more frequent in women, the risk of having cardiovascular disease is equal in both sexes. So, um, and also cardiovascular death is, or cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of dying prematurely in rheumatoid arthritis and in other rheumatic diseases as well, including lupus. So what it means for people having these diseases? Well, it means that they may live five to 10 years less than the general population. And you can imagine what you can do with five or 10 years extra if you don't develop cardiovascular disease. And the most important thing here is this risk is independent of the risk that is associated with the traditional risk factors. What are those traditional risk factors? Like diabetes, smoking, high blood pressure, etc. If you have all those things, you still have those risks plus the risk associated with rheumatic diseases. Next slide, please. And keep this in mind because you need to deal with both. So what can you do as a patient to lower this risk, which is there? Next slide, please. You actually can do a lot of things. The first and most important that we always tell our patients is, please take your medications. Why? Because the medications have shown our research and all the research, research has shown that not only treat the inflammation, but also treats complications. So by doing this, and we have shown in a very recent study that the risk of cardiovascular disease in people with rheumatoid arthritis has significantly decreased over time. When we compare people who have rheumatoid arthritis that started, let's say 1997, versus those who started in 2006 or after and compare the rates, as you can see here, the dead was 45% for people who were diagnosed since 1996 up to 2000. And then when you compare those 2000 and onwards, the risk is almost 6%, which is very close to what is the, the risk in the general population. So this is great news. And I think that is because we are actually doing a good job and you guys are doing a very good job now um, taking your pills. Next slide. So, I said medication, but also some medications have been associated with an increased risk of developing cardiovascular disease, including very, this is a long story that has been happening for many years, um, the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, which is our anti-inflammatories that you can get over the counter, such as Advil, aspirin, naproxen, Celebrex, um, et cetera. 
those are not including Tylenol or acetaminophen, which is a pain uh, medication who has no effect on inflammation. So most anti-inflammatory medications have been associated with an increased risk of developing cardiovascular disease by promoting blood clot. The only exception, and it's consistently gone along all multiple studies, seems to be uh, aspirin and naproxen. However, other drugs, which are very commonly used and have changed the life expectancy of rheumatic diseases, are glucocorticoids, the prednisone or cortisone, as you probably know the name. So glucocorticoids are not a bad drugs. They actually change the life, especially in lupus patients or very bad systemic diseases. They actually, the life expectancy changed dramatically after we start using glucocorticoids. However, these medications, if you're using for you use them for a long time in a higher dose, it will increase the risk of developing cardiovascular complications. This is a study that I did as a, my PhD thesis. We wanted to see, well, how much is actually the risk? Well, we said, what if you compare people who take it versus who, those who do not take it? Doesn't matter what dose and for how long. Well, if you take at least one pill, the risk versus non taking a, a, a pill of prednisone, the risk was 68% associated with taking prednisone. How, now, how about the duration? For every year of cumulative year you, you take prednisone, could be 10 months now and two months in two years, the risk increases by 10%. How about the dose? Well, for each tablet of five milligrams that you take, the risk will increase 13% independent of, uh, of the duration, right? So you can add up those numbers and it actually will give you a significant risk over time. That's why you will have to minimize the dose of prednisone, especially high dose above five milligrams per day. They're very good and we still use them and we still recommend them because those, these medications could save lives and then we will have to use them. However, they're not the solid treatment to control disease. And this is something that you have to remember. If you take a medication that's only medication prednisone and not taking anything else, you are not being treated properly and you should discuss this with your physician. Next slide, please. Other drugs have been also um, shown benefits like methotrexate, for instance, and biologics have also been effective in demonstrate this. However, you can do other things that are related and is our due solo responsibility to discuss with your physician. If you smoke, you really need to make a plan or consider the possibility of smoking. Because smoking not only increases the risk of cardiovascular disease, but those who are not here and do not have rheumatic diseases, you need to know that smoking doubles the risk of developing rheumatoid arthritis and lupus. And also people who smoke and already have a rheumatic disease, the therapies that you're receiving do not work as well as those who do not smoke. So you're not getting the full benefit of your therapies. And that's something that you need to consider. It's not an easy task, but there are plans that you need to discuss. And when you're ready to go ahead, you need to consider this for a possibility to influence your cardiovascular risk. What else can you do? We always come, and it's a very common question that individuals ask us, what can I eat to actually improve my health? Well, this is what we call the healthy diet. Um, the healthy diet is, is we're gonna talk about later on, but is um, the diet influenced inflammation. The carbohydrates or fatty, uh, 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 meals increase lipids and also increase the level of inflammation in the arteries. So we prefer to recommend um, low, low fat meals. Um, you can also need to do other um, activities such as physical activity and we'll show a slide later on. So uh, if you are, for instance, overweight, uh, you also have a high risk because you have high insulin resistance, which is a phenomenon that happens it makes the, 
the insulin harder to actually bring energy to the cells and produce more uh, uh, risk of developing high cholesterol in your blood. And, and you also show more protein in the urine. Uh, so good to remember, all those risk factors do not explain the risk of cardiovascular disease because you may say, well, I don't smoke. I'm actually uh, healthy in terms of weight. I don't have high blood pressure. Well, if you have arthritis, you still have an increased risk of developing cardiovascular disease by having inflammatory arthritis. Please, next slide. So here is what's important. We always talk about what can I eat? This is a, a very quick uh, uh, review on what healthy food you can have. And there is a website that you can check at the end. It will be available to you after this presentation. So protein. You need to in ingest modern fish and poultry, like salmon, chicken, uh, white fish, uh, or wet meat, low red meat, uh, like beef or lamb, or because they have fatty uh, content, but you still have to eat it because if you don't eat it, you will develop anemia. Uh, like uh, we see quite often in people who have um, uh, abandoned red meat. Um, we also have to emphasize on plant-based proteins like quinoa, lentils, beans, etc. Now, how, what type of fats? Not all fats are bad. Uh, olive oil is a good source of uh, fat. Uh, we, you, you need to emphasize on carbohydrates. If you eat carbohydrates, which, which we all do, it has to be on whole grains. Uh, you have to eat fruits and vegetables uh, listed here and moderate alcohol. Uh, alcohol used to be uh, uh, considered an um, inducer of the good cholesterol, but recent research has actually shown that this may be actually not the case. However, as a fun fact, I always recommend my patients, every time they get a, achieve a goal, they should cheer with me with a glass of wine at dinner. So don't say that I say that publicly, okay? Next slide, please. So another important aspect, <coughs> excuse me, and this is extremely important, is perhaps something that we have forgot quite often. We hear all the time, uh, and you may say, well, I actually have arthritis, therefore for me, it's very difficult to do physical activity. I will recommend you to go to these sites, especially the Maripac Arthritis Program has designed um, a physical activity program for people with arthritis. And any physical activity is better than just being a couch potato. Even if you stand up and walk a little bit, has been shown that moving is better than not moving at all. So I would recommend you get a program, get a trainer, if you can afford it. If not, you can. there's such a lot of tutorials uh, to get uh, engaged in physical activity. And these are things you can do to yourself to decrease the risk of having cardiovascular disease and you will live longer and healthier, which is what we all want. Next slide, please. So in summary, arthritis should be considered a risk condition for cardiovascular disease. Nowadays, as soon as you get a diagnosis, for instance, diabetes or high blood pressure, people, physicians start thinking, oh, this is a risk of cardiovascular disease, and therefore we need to start making doing st strategies to prevent cardiovascular disease. This should be the same for any type of inflammatory arthritis. And this is important to discuss with family physicians and people with inflammatory arthritis. What uh, this is important? Well, because cardiovascular risk, risk should be checked with all patients with arthritis. And this is something that we together need to do. We as a rheumatologist, and primary care physicians. Um, and you do diet and also very important, you can do this and you can help. The say of less is better in medications that doesn't apply. In rheumatic diseases, patients need to take their medications because this has been shown that if you stop or decrease or you don't take it as prescribed, the risk goes back higher when you compare to those who actually take it as they prescribe. Number two, be active. Number three, eat healthy foods. 
Next slide. And I think I, the fun part is about to start. Sure, and thank you so much, Dr. Avina Zubiata, for a wonderful journey through, although it's kind of scary at the beginning where you shared the numbers that really have proven using that administrative data that the risks are much higher for us living with arthritis. Um, but it was reassuring to see that if we take our medications and do those other things, that our risk isn't that much or is considerably less than it would have been if we weren't taking our medication. So I was relieved to see the change in the numbers over time. Uh, we want uh, to just take the pulse um, now, uh, pun intended, of uh, those participating today. Uh, so can we have the final polling question, please? So how do you feel now? Please choose the option that best fits. Are you glad that you learned some more about this topic? Do you want to learn even more about it? Do you feel that you have the information that you now need? Or is there something else that these options don't capture that you would like to put in the chat box? So we'll give you just a minute to, uh, to enter your uh, favorite option there, and then we'll look at the results. And uh, maybe while we're waiting for the results, I saw that Dr. Avina answered already the first question in the question and answer, which is, why has nobody found a cure for arthritis yet, especially with all the new technologies? And if you check the answer box there, Dr. Avina said, well, it's because from some of them, we don't know the causes yet. Uh, there's over 100 kinds of arthritis, and not all the causes are known for it. Did you want to add anything to that, um, Dr. Avina? Yes, the most important is because the only way to find is through research. And I, I want to take an example of what happened with this terrible pandemic that we're living. Why we got so quick and so fast to a solution? Because there was a huge amount of money invested in research and collaboration across the world. So research and we use knowledge that was existing in some other areas and we apply very quickly and we found a solution. And the same should be done collaboratively uh, and, and finding a solution. It's through research the only way. There is no divinity here, but it's the research. And once we know more, uh, we will eventually get there. We have made a significant advancement with therapies now. We don't see cripple disease that we saw when I was doing my rheumatology training. It was quite common to see people crippled with their hands, and we don't see that anymore. And as I said, I show you an example. The uh, cardiovascular risk is, has been decreased because we have better therapies now. So it's one step at a time, but it's through research. And I'm glad that you are here because you can support research in many ways. Thank you. Um, maybe before we move into the rest of the questions, could we have the results of the poll, please? So 35% uh, of people saying, I'm glad that I learned more about this, uh, but 50, close to 50% are saying, hey, it would be great to learn even more. 10% uh, are saying that I now have the information that I need. Uh, and in the chat box, there were some very nice compliments about, uh, about the presentation. So thank you. Let's, let's move on to um, some more of your questions. Um, one of the questions that has come up in different ways, Dr. Avina, is what, um, is the risk the same for osteoarthritis as it is for the inflammatory arthritis? Uh, it's not the same, but the risk has been demonstrated as well. And again, the, even though osteoarthritis is not considered an inflammatory arthritis, when you go and look at the biopsies of cartilage, you see inflammation in osteoarthritis but the risk is significantly less, but it's higher than the general population that doesn't have uh, osteoarthritis, but it's less. So if it's less for osteoarthritis than it is for the inflammatory arthritis, would it still be beneficial to do the other things that you talked about, such as the Absolutely. diet and exercise? And Absolutely, absolutely. The big difference here, and it's a big problem, and we're still, this is actually a huge problem, we still do not have medications like we do have in rheumatoid arthritis or lupus that decrease or slow the progression of the disease. And this huge amount of money invested in research 
and eventually we will get there so we can arrest the progression of the disease and that will significantly improve the risk of cardiovascular disease. Okay, um, we have some more questions about uh, um, some of the medications. Uh, so for example, uh, there's one thing, are, are NSAIDs bad to take long-term? Are they something that we should be focusing just on the short-term? Yes, uh, we do not recommend um, short-term, long-term use of NSAIDs or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications because not only because they cardiovascular disease, they also have other complications. They increase the risk of renal, renal toxicity, kidney problem, and also uh, stomach bleeding ulcers. So if you actually require a lot of anti-inflammatory medications to control your disease, most often we're talking about osteoarthritis, then you need to talk about other alternative therapies such as Tylenol or acetaminophen, physical therapy, local therapy with, et cetera. There are many treatments that don't require, but yes, that applies to not taking for long-term. Thank you. Um, there's some questions you pointed out about the risks between men <laughs> and women that it was very similar, but there's a question in the box that if there is a, more women have inflammatory arthritis than have men, um, and that uh, should, should there be um, some education provided to women given that um, the signs of a heart attack might be different, say, in a woman than a man? Yes, I mean, the, the answer is yes. Education always will be. Um, and I think it has to be uh, probably education about awareness to the physicians or patients to do recognize that they may present and behave differently compared to men. And in fact, that's what happens quite often. They have no chest pain and they're still having a heart attack until they just lost conscious and they ended up in the hospital, right? So yes, it needs to be done. Okay. Uh, and not surprisingly, <coughs> there's some questions about blood clots, Dr. Ravina. And um, there, one of the first question that came up on blood clots uh, is um, we, we're reading a lot right now about the AstraZeneca uh, vaccine, um, not the other vaccines, but the AstraZeneca one in particular. Um, when you're referring, referring to these blood clot issues, are they similar to the blood clots that um, we hear reported with uh, these vaccines? Uh, the blood clot is the same always. However, this is a different phenomenon. Uh, the, the blood clots associated with vaccine are more diffuse, more rapidly progressive, and more systemic. Different, plates, uh, different places at the same time. And this is, this is not associated with this. What it is associated with this is the COVID risk of blood clots. COVID on its own has the risk of high, actually the risk is very high if you develop COVID to develop uh, blood clots. And the same rationale is, it is the inflammation. COVID is a very, it creates a, such a huge amount of inflammation in the lung and in the body in general that increases the risk of blood clots. So, but there are two different phenomena. And just as a reminder, and this is because of the hesitance, I will have to take this opportunity to talk about vaccines. There has been three cases in Canada of blood clots in the AstraZeneca vaccine. And there has been 3 million doses of vaccine administered in Canada. So if you compare three in 3 million, it's extremely rare. But if you develop COVID, the risk will be as a 40% of people with COVID could get into hospital will have an, a risk of blood clots. So the risk of developing COVID is higher and the blood clots is higher. So this should not be, and I know nobody wants to be the one in a 3 million, but if you don't vaccinate yourself, then you will have an increased risk of developing COVID and an increased risk of developing blood clots but they're not the same things for vaccine clots and rheumatic disease clots. Okay, so uh, a clot is a clot, but how it becomes a clot and what happens after it uh, is different um, in the COVID case versus this case. Thank you. Um, we have a question about duration of disease. 
of if you've been living with RA or ju uh, juvenile idiopathic uh, arthritis for 50 years or, or for other long periods of time, is your risk greater because of a longer duration? Um, no, the risk is not, uh, and I'm gonna tell you why. The, um, remember what I said about the risk is highest in the first year after the diagnosis? What is the pick? There is two phenomena why we see that, two reasons that could explain why. One is we all have different risk. We came with a different gene pool and our risks are measured based on our genes. So one of the reasons why people have high risk early on is because of the inflammatory diseases or also because the risk and those who are gonna develop it happens very early and expresses very quickly. Once you finish that period, those who are susceptible to develop heart disease no longer exist over time. However, if you stop taking your medications or and you have active disease, the risk goes back again because the inflammation still lingering there is the main driver. <clears throat> what inflammation does, and I hope I'm, I, this is very important, it, we all have natural anticoagulants in our blood circulated every single day that prevent us to develop blood clots, okay? We all have natural. When you have high levels of inflammation, they interfere with this natural anticoagulants in your blood. And therefore the risk of developing blood clots will happen. So if you have inflammation going on, you're playing with fire, that's why. But the risk already passes if you were supposed to be a high risk very early on and the risk develops decreases over time because mainly because the susceptibility has passed but also because of treatment so that definitely goes back to your point about the importance of taking those medications to control the disease you control the inflammation you control the risk and for now, those people who are the 90 to 82 per, 92 percent who do not have a heart attack that doesn't mean you didn't get it initially, therefore you're free, you're out of the woods. No, you still had a risk because if your inflammation is not controlled, you will be at risk at some point. Keep an eye on it and do what you need to do to prevent it. Thank you. Um, there's lots of questions and I just want to uh, highlight that we have just under 10 minutes left. And so we're probably not going to be able to cover all the questions. So don't get mad at Dr. Avina. It is his birthday. It's not his fault if he can't cover all the questions. You can blame me. Um, so we'll do as many as we can, given the time that we have left. Uh, so there was a question about psoriatic arthritis, but that wasn't included on the slides. Um, is it the same as RA or similar to RA? Uh, yes, it's actually very similar to RA, and, and, and we just have not published that study. I have presented the data in conferences, but I only present data today that has been peer-reviewed and has been scientifically validated by our peers, and therefore, but yes, the risk is similar in psoriatic arthritis, and it's very similar to rheumatoid arthritis, as those two diseases behave similarly. Thank you. Um, there's a question about hardening of the arteries, in particular, the carotid arteries in the neck. Um, should patients be tested for that? Uh, yes, it's a preventive measure, especially you have high, uh, again, uh, you have to go back to your traditional risk factors. Traditional risk factors include if you have a family member who had a heart attacks or strokes, especially on the BH of 60, then you have to screen for uh, uh, all those factors. And, and there has been studying the carotid, the carotid arteries is a surrogate or, or a, a picture that doesn't reflect exactly what's going on, but it can be used because it has been associated with risk of having a stroke. If you have progressive significant hardening of the carotid arteries, then you're a higher risk of developing stroke than those who do not. And that should be part of the screening process if you are at risk. 
especially if you have family history. Of, of following up, of having your physician know your family history, as well as uh, checkups with your doctor and or your rheumatologist. Yes, and you have to empower, and patients are empowered. I would encourage you guys to empower yourselves to discuss this openly with your physician. Sometimes we just forget about it. And we just focus on the arthritis and that's it or whatever it is the topic today. But you are entitled and this is your right and you should empower yourself to ask for this. Thank Nobody you. will be mad. Thank you for bringing that up because there were a couple questions about how to have that conversation with a doctor who might not be as, um, you're afraid that they might not be as open to it. Uh, so your advice in, in how to have that conversation? Uh, it, 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 it may be, you may feel itchy that you may uh, make your physician angry. And it's the way you actually say it. It's, it's, we're open, we don't know everything and we know we're distracted quite often. So you just have to say, Openly, uh, I heard, I attended a seminar, or whatever, and they mentioned that I have an increased risk of developing cardiovascular disease, and that encouraged me to discuss with you what measures I need to do and preventive measures and screening, and and I would like to talk about this. And physicians will will receive this, but if you come and say, doctor, I need you to do this because you haven't done it and you are actually not taking care of me. That will not be polite, right? It's imagine is you're actually your fiance. You don't want to make your fiance upset. And there's a relationship between your physician. So you keep heard it in it a your first from Arthritis Research Canada. Treat your physician like your fiance when those conversations. Thank you. That yeah, you don't want to make upset, right? It's yeah. It's a it's a it's a nice conversation that has to keep flowing all the time. Okay, a couple more questions. Um, what about statins? Great question. Phenomenal question. And this is some research has been done by another colleague of mine, Dr. Mary DeBera, who you probably had joined before in, in these uh, webinars. She showed in part of her PhD thesis, she showed that people who stop statins actually have an increased risk of developing cardiovascular disease, which we knew that happened in the general population. But more recent research has shown also the statins not only prevents cardiovascular disease, there was a very famous study that showed that people with, um, who, ha who took statins from the general population actually die less, not only from cardiovascular disease, but for other any cause of death compared to those people who discontinue statins. So statins are great, and if you need it, you have to take it. It has been shown that statins have actually an anti-inflammatory benefit. And again, if you treat inflammation, you decrease your risk. Okay, thank you. Um, there's a question here that, um, is it all right to celebrate with that lovely glass of wine you mentioned on methotrexate? I would so Yes, love. yes, it is. Remember, a lot of people don't want to take methotrexate because what they can read and they hear about, you cannot drink, you can still drink. Uh, that's why you need your blood work. You get your blood work. If your enzyme levels are okay, you can still have your glass of wine on Friday or in every May 12th to celebrate Dr. Avinia's birthday. That's okay. Then you, you will be okay. But it has to be a normal glass, not a glass the size of the Stanley Cup. Okay. Too bad about the Stanley Cup size, but if you get really nice wine, then a small amount can be uh, very yes. palatable. Um, as a South Asian with RA, with heart disease in the family, um, are, and South Asians have a higher risk of heart attacks, what can the, um, somebody with an even greater risk in the South Asian population, what can we do about our genetic makeup that way? Uh, for now, we cannot change our genes. We can change the influence the genes have, for instance, in a diet. If you have this lipidemia or high cholesterol or high triglycerides, then you have to take first your diet and then secondly your statins. If you do that, you probably are adjusting for those things. Um, but I would say most Asians have a very healthy diet. Um, so I don't think we need to work on too much on that. Maybe physical activity, they're not engaged in physical activity. And, and I think that that will be, if you smoke, quit your smoking. You cannot change your genes yet, but we will be at some point able to do that. 
Okay, so I think we're running out of time in, in terms of uh, questions, but you would like to know that the most recent posting in the Q&A was, I love this man. So if that is not a nice message to hear on your birthday, I don't know what else is. So. Oh, I appreciate it. Thank you. So I just want to take the opportunity to thank everyone who has joined us today. And we hope you found this webinar informative, helpful, and fun, which isn't difficult for it to be fun when uh, Dr. Vina is speaking. So um, we definitely, I think, ticked all those boxes. We would like to thank our sponsors of the Arthritis Research Education Series for their support. They include Merck, uh, Fresnesius uh, Cabi, Gilead Sciences Canada, and Novartis. And we want to give a special thank you, and perhaps we could all do it as a, as a birthday whoop whoop uh, to Dr. Avina for we're really grateful for to have the opportunity to share your research with us on this important topic. Although initially scary, you've given us great hope that actually if we do the right things, um, that, that uh, those risks are significantly reduced. Um, for those of you who haven't had the opportunity to visit the Arthritis Research Canada website, please do so, especially on the Arthritis Research Education Series page. Because there you will find the videos, um, there you will find additional information, uh, and clearly from the comments here in the box today, people are finding this very informative and helpful. Um, as soon as this webinar ends, we'll be sending a quick survey because it's very helpful for us to know what worked and what we could replicate for future webinars and what we could tweak, what we could improve. Um, and also we'd like ideas from you about other topics that you would like us to cover. You can find us at arthritisresearch.ca and please also know that a recording of today's webinar, if you want to hear it again, because sometimes hearing it a second time can be helpful, uh, will be available on the Arthritis Research Canada Education Series episode page four, and a link will be provided um, in follow up by email. So thank you all for joining us today, and we're wishing you a lovely afternoon. And Dr. Avina, you can celebrate your birthday with a small glass of wine, the right wine. Uh, okay. Thank you. Double dose today. Okay. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everybody.